is Gil Lonsrich, who was actually um, a uh, nose pierce from when he was an undergraduate. So if my Coleman number is one, I think, Gil, you might be, have a negative Coleman number. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, Gil has known Pierce since he's an undergraduate, and he's going to tell us about normal state and electron pairing in, fer, uh, in ferromagnetic and ferroelectric systems. So Gil. Good morning, and um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here on this special occasion for Piers. Um, I have known Piers since his early days in the uh, University of Cambridge, and um, for a fleeting moment, for maybe a year or two, I managed to keep up with him as his tutorial supervisor, or at least I think I kept up with him. And ever since, um, the roles have been reversed, the pupil and the, and the tutors are inverted. Um, this is Piers, you may recognize it, he hasn't changed very much. Um, when he was inducted uh, to the, um, the fellowship of the Trinity College as a research fellow in 1984, and behind him, um, is the, his college's famous Great Hall, which holds the portraits around the perimeter of um, f f f former um, famous fellows of the college, including, um, Einstein, uh, including Newton, Maxwell, J.J. Thompson, and Rutherford. And the, the hall is also known for uh, being the inspiration for the idea, um, the, 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 the idea of um, how to visualize the Rutherford model of the atom. And the, the phrase that was invented was fly in the cathedral. And the fly is the nucleus, and the cathedral is the atom as a whole. And um, one night uh, during a formal dinner, <clears throat> the, the, fel the fellows and their guests were treated to a demonstration of this idea when um, they were startled to see high up in the, in the hall a beautiful model glider um, navigating the hall over long periods of time. And so it was thought that this was supposed to be a, the representation of the fly in the cathedral in real life. <laughs> and at, at first, it was thought by most people that this was, that an experimentalist was behind this demonstration. No one came forward. But um, then it, was, um, it came to light that peers, um, that for peers, the construction of glider, it was, a, it was a great passion. So we all had our suspicion of who was behind this beautiful demonstration. So um, I, today I want to talk about some problems that, that Piers and I have discussed over the years. There are just two, two problems that overlap with our discussions to make this manageable. And they concern the, the problem of uh, quantum phase transitions in particular, on the border of ferromagnetism, for our example, and on the border of ferroelectricity. And in particular, I'd like to um, discuss the possible interpretation of recent um, findings published in these articles, or presented in these articles, uh, by Montesexena, uh, Stephen, Stephen Rowley, and their co-workers, particularly Matt Cox, Seb Hines, Haynes, and um, Karsten Anderlein, and others. So the first problem, and um, also I want to mention that, um, that the um, very, very fruitful discussions that I've had with Premi on these problems, and, and she is the first author in a review 
concerning quantum criticality in ferroelectric materials. So I want to talk about, as I said, two problems um, selected um, problems. The first is the existence of a ubiquitous peak in the order parameter susceptibility, both found both in the, on the border of ferromagnetism and ferroelectricity. So one can think about the problem in this way and in a conjugate applied magnetic field. The order parameter initially appears to grow um, as a result of thermal agitation. And this is surprising at first sight. And it's sometimes given, uh, described under the phrase order by disorder. And here is, for example, are a few cases among relatively simple D metals on the border of ferromagnetism, where the stoner enhancement factor, which is closely related to the Wilson uh, ratio, varies from about 10 to 100. Although the peaks are very weak, they're completely reproducible and been seen many times. And what we see is the, the peak position shifting down um, towards zero as you approach the ferromagnetic critical point. But this, this phenomenon has been seen with even greater precision accuracy on the border of ferroelectrics. In particular, there's recent data in strontium titanate, which is right at the edge of being a ferroelectric. With a tiny negative pressure, it goes into a ferroelectric state. Uh, so what is plotted now is not the susceptibility, but the inverse susceptibility. So the peak is now a minimum. And what we see is that the minimum position, as the pressure decreases, and one goes, enters the border of the ferroelectric state, the minimum shifts down and appears to disappear at the ferroelectric quantum critical point itself. All the evidence is that the ferroelectric transition, in this case, is second order down to the lowest temperature. Now, um, Curiously, although the peak and the susceptibility in the ferromagnet has been known for many years, um, a consistent and agreed upon interpretation um, has not been found, at least not a quantitative interpretation. These peaks has, has not yet been found, although there are many proposals that are very interesting. But in this case, I think we can actually say where this phenomenon arises, that is minimum the inversibility or peak and the susceptibility itself. And to, to try to describe this, we begin with a discussion of what these soft modes are, the soft critical modes, which are paramagnons in the border of ferromagnetism for ferromagnetic metals, but in this case correspond to um, relative displacements of the charged titanium and oxygen atom. And this, these, these displacements give rise to the, the lowest transverse optical mode, the polar transverse optical mode, um, the gap of the mode can be tuned either with pressure, strain, or um, isotopic substitution, or chemical substitution to essentially map out a phase diagram uh, a bit like this. And strontium titanate finds itself very close to this edge right here at ambient pressure and without doping, the stoichiometric state. Um, so if we look at the, the standard description of a problem like this, um, we would look, start by noticing that the dispersion relation for the soft mode becomes linear in, in Q as the gap goes to zero, so right at the critical point. So the dynamical exponent in this case is one, so that in a cubic case, the effective dimension for a quantum critical phenomena is the critic, the marginal dimensions, four in this case. And this means that both the scaling arguments and mean field, uh, the self-consistent mean field theory, theory based on the phi to the four um, free energy function or, or action um, 
uh, they lead to the same results apart from a logarithmic correction. And in particular, the mean field description leads to a prediction that the, both the Grunison ratio and the susceptibility, the dielectric susceptibility or dielectric constant, um, diverge at low temperatures, one over the temperature squared. Also predicted is that the ferroelectric QA temperature squared um, should vary linearly with the distance, the pressure, the distance from the um, quantum critical point. And in fact, the, these findings, these predictions agree with a lot of measurements at present. Um, however, this, this picture only holds right at the quantum critical point. And if we go out in pressure, for example, um, further out, we they lose these, this quantum critical behavior indicated here in green. And we get into an activated behavior where the inverse susceptibility is a slowly mo um, varying monotonic, monotonically increasing function of temperature, which is um, predicted both by the self-consistent mean field theory and the famous um, Barrett model, which has been traditionally used to describe the quantum paraelectric state. However, this picture breaks down, as I indicated, instead of this monotonically increasing um, dependence, we get a drop, a minimum, as shown here, and a, a characteristic and a distinctive feature of this. In fact, this is the most thorough data yet collected on any of these types of problems. And the most distinctive feature is that the minimum, the temperature at the minimum, T min, um, the square of that temperature is a linear function of the pressure difference from the critical pressure. So it goes to zero at the, at the critical pressure in the same way that the inverse susceptibility, the t equals zero inverse susceptibility. So therefore, these two quantities are proportional to each other. Um, now, this, this behavior is precisely what is predicted by the model that Premi discussed on Monday, which involves the coupling of the order parameter field, which in this case is the electric polarization, and the uh, volume strain field. So we have a free uh, line action that involves the contribution from the order parameter from the uh, lattice displacement u, and, the, and then the cross term. Um, involving this coupling, which is called an uh, electrostrictive coupling. And this, um, when, when the, all the parameters of the model are actually known independently of the experiments I've just presented. And, and uh, within these, or these, these model parameters, one finds that this, this theoretical description here does in fact predict that the minimum temperature squared should go linearly with a pressure difference from the critical pressure. And these are uh, basically three, uh, three slopes corresponding to different values of the optical, transverse optical frequency gap at zero pressure. And the correct slope that explains the data can be obtained with a, a gap which is within a factor of two of that measured by uh, neutron scattering experiments. So uh, the way then to describe the, the quantum paraelectric state is that above a certain temperature of order T min, something like the Barrett formula applies. But this breaks down below T min. And there we must think of the quantum paraelectric state as this hybridized state, hybridized the hybridization being between the polarization field, the order parameter field, and the volume strain. And that this crossover line can actually be understood quantitatively, as I explained in the previous slides. So we think that this problem is on its way to being understood for the ferroelectrics. And one then may wonder whether we could now go back 
and see if a similar effect could play an important role on the border of ferromagnetism as well. But there, the problem is much more complicated, and other effects are competitive. The second problem I wanted to discuss in this short talk um, is also connected with a peak. But in this case, with a peak of the uh, superconducting transition temperature as a function of the proximity to the quantum critical point. So we know that, that in the case of magnetic quantum critical points, there are many theoretical studies that suggest that the ordering, the superconducting ordering temperature due arising from the exchange of spin fluctuations, which would be paramagnons or antiparamagnons, that this type of transition temperature tends to rise, generally speaking, as one approaches the, quantum, ferrum, the magnetic quantum critical point. And there are now many, many examples of this phenomenon experimentally. Most of them are involve the border of antiferromagnetism, but there are a few intriguing examples involving the border of ferromagnetism. And I mentioned two cases here, a quasi-two-dimensional ferromagnet um, calcium rubinate and a highly anisotropic uniaxial uh, material with uniaxial magnetic anisotropy, uranium, germanium-2. And there are a number of other examples in the same class now that also exhibit this phenomenon. So that has been an evolving story going back to the beginning of early discussion periods that I had in the 1980s already. But um, the corresponding problem on the border of ferroelectricity is still being, um, under, still being studied. And there is some evidence that something similar is happening. So for example, this is data from um, Stephen Rowley and his group, which shows that the superconducting transition temperature in a charge carrier doped um, strontium Tight, uh, tight, titrate, um, that the TC tends to rise as we approach the, um, the effective ferroelectric critical point. We're defined in the dope system by the position where the optical gap goes to zero, because we cannot measure the dielectric constant at that point. But we can still measure the optical gap. Um, there is also some new data from uh, Benia's group and others that suggest that by using chemical and um, isotopic substitution, that suggests that TC actually drops on this side, on the ferroelectric side. So though we don't have a complete mapping at the moment within a single system, there is evidence that as in the case of the magnetic system, the transition temperature tends to be enhanced around the ferroelectric critical point. So it's, now we might, what I want to do in the remaining part of this um, talk is just consider whether this uh, phenomena can be understood or thought about in terms of the exchange of these soft modes, that is, the, the carriers um, doped in the system interact with the soft modes that we've been talking about, the polar transverse optical modes, and that the exchange of these soft modes can somehow play the role equivalent to that of paramagnons on the border of magnetism. However, it turns out the problem is, in this respect, actually more complicated than that suggests. And in some ways, it's simple, um, but different from what we may have naively expected. So um, if we use this, the dielectric function theory for the effective interaction, then we have to express the dielectric function in terms of the, the effect due to these transverse polar modes. So that yields one resonance shown here, where the frequency squared in the denominator is the frequency of the soft mode. So when we reach the quantum critical point, delta goes to 0. However, minimally, we have to also, and importantly, include a contribution from the doped carriers themselves. So there are two resonances minimally, one due to the transverse optical mode, one due to the conduction electrons, which should be um, represented by the, um, by the Linard function. But there is a simple analytic expression that 
that represents the linear function exactly in the limit of low um, omega over q and low q over omega. And it's shown here that it's useful because of its similarity to the resonance produced by the polar mode. And the polar frequency squared is replaced by the Fermi velocity q squared. So there is a restoring, it is if, as if the Fermi system has a restoring force. And of course, that restoring force is due to the Pauli principle. So this simple expression is exactly reproduces the linear function and the two limits I indicated. And it's good enough for our purposes. But of course, the story does not end there. We now have to work on the pairing interaction, or the total interaction, by taking the inverse of dielectric function. And that can be written in terms of two resonances and a constant term. So the, this term here is due to the direct repulsion between the electron. And these two resonances potentially attractive when the frequency is uh, low, lower than the omega plus to omega minus. And the omega plus and omega minus are the longitudinal yeah, are the longitudinal frequencies, um, as opposed to the transverse frequencies that appear here. So this is a rewriting. There's nothing new here that isn't already here. However, what is being exchanged is not equivalent to the problem of paramagnet. What is being exchanged are, in fact, longitudinal fluctuations. And the effect of delta, however, does not, is not absent, but is subtly inside of these functions, omega plus and omega minus, which can be written out explicitly, but are very complicated. So, so it's not so easy to see a pairing arising from the exchange of transverse optical modes in this case. It is really actually apparently due to the, the exchange of longitudinal optical modes, two of them, which are hybridized, but which are affected by the gap delta. And so um, that interaction, in a sense, solves, it, it identifies the problem uniquely. And so at this point, it's a question of how to solve it. You cannot use simple BCS type analyses. Um, ideally, you should use the full Eliasberg theory, where you cannot assume that the frequency of the bosons is small compared with the Fermi energy, for one thing. Uh, you can also try, uh, attempt to simplify the numerics by using the so-called KMK approximation for the, um, for the Eliasberg equation. But in fact, both have been done. And it's still unpublished paper by Ender, Ender, um, Ender, Dendelman, and Littlewood have used the full Eliasberg equation. We use the KMK approximation. But what happens is more or less the same, namely that the model predicts that the transition temperature for the density of relevant to the experiment, the superconducting transition temperature tends to rise as we approach the ferroelectric critical point. What is also predicted is that Tc should have a peak as a function of a carrier density. And the peak position is roughly in the right place, around 10 to the 20 up carriers per cc. Now, what's interesting about this is that these are completely independent of free adjustable parameters. And that may be the first time um, over since the 50s that a parameter-free calculation for this problem had actually been carried through. Although I think Takata did something very similar um, in the 1980s, a long time ago, but then partially forgotten. And <coughs> but the important point is that although it predicts, the model predicts qualitatively what is seen, um, and in particular, we see that the collapse of the of the gap of the transverse optical mode does have consequences and tends to enhance TC on the border of ferroelectricity. But what cannot be done in this type of calculation is to predict the actual, max, actual value of the transition temperature at the maximum, because it turns out that value depends on the cutoff 
in the, uh, the high frequency cutoff in the Eliasberg theory. So this problem is still being debated. So, so we can say if we examine what the model is doing, the drop in TC at low density is very simple. It's a simple origin. And of course, it's just due to the fact that the, the, the single particle density of states for the carriers is dropping off at low density. But the drop off at higher density was, more, was considered more puzzling for many years. It is origin is physically very transparent. It is simply that as carriers are added to the system, the ions become screened. And so this high superconductivity in this region is a consequence of the fact that, <clears throat> that the interaction is essentially an interaction mediated by ions which are charged, whereas the normal superconductivity at much higher density is described in terms of neutral atoms that have only a weak polarization and therefore a weak effective interaction. So this, this is a very interesting phenomena which was already foreseen many years ago by Larkin and can be called ionic superconductivity. So uh, in the summary slide, I just want to mention one point, the, the last point, which is the following, that it may be at the, of course, the, the, at the peak of the transition, the density is still small, 10 to the 20 carriers per cc. And to get a transition temperature of order half a Kelvin or higher, one needs an extraordinarily strong effective interaction between the carriers. In fact, as strong as one may invoke for for example, high temperature superconductors. But high TC is not obtained because of the screening effect at higher densities. And so the, the problem in this area is to see if it is possible to, um, to prevent the screening from clicking in too early as a function of density. And this might indeed occur in the case of ferroelectrics and anti-ferroelectric materials. And it's possible the materials like um, BKBO are of this kind, ionic superconductors, and they have um, superconducting transition temperatures approaching 40 Kelvin. So now I'll just simply end where I started and, and want to um, wish Thiers a very happy birthday. Thank you.